Hello and welcome to On Point. I'm Imai Milan Wright. According to Global Homeless Statistics, approximately 100 million people are homeless worldwide. Census reports in Los Angeles County say some 50 to 60,000 people are homeless. A CSU study says one in 10 Cal State students are homeless and one in five worry about where their next meal is coming from. In fact, a study by Project Home Community shows 20% of those experience homelessness are under the age of 18. When it comes to media images of these individuals, some media outlets may stereotype homeless people while others work harder to humanize them. Journalists and advocates for the homeless try to communicate the reality of the everyday circumstances people are facing. They look for ways to capture the happiness as well as the personal struggles of those without a home as they fight oppression. Even so, CISA psychology professor Holly Tonian says many Americans still don't understand the complexities of the issues or see homeless people as individuals. The idea that whenever um, humans feel that they're interacting with someone who is an anonymous part of a crowd, um, we often call that dehumanizing, when um, we feel that others are a part of a mass or a crowd or not individuals, then we also might be less likely to help them out. So anything that a documentary journalist can do to help the viewer see individuals who are homeless as people with stories um, who are unique and individual, the more likely it will be that um, people who are watching that documentary will feel um, a moral obligation to help out or to contribute to a solution. Some who fight for the rights of the homeless may view the issue differently. They may criticize portrayals of the homeless as being a form of exploitation. On Point's Lundy Sagastume has more. Thank you, Amaya Milan. I want to thank my guests for being here today. My first guest is Laura Rathbone, a advocate for the homeless in the San Fernando Valley. My second guest is David Blumenkratz, photojournalist and CSUN journalism professor. So let's get right into it. Is it dehumanizing to homeless people to be photographed? Laura, I would like to start with you. Whew, um, I think it depends on what situation they're in. Um, I don't like documenting people when they're in extreme crisis, when it could quite, quite possibly be the worst day of their lives ever. But I do feel it does need to be documented. So I go back and forth. Um, I often take pictures and video of the ones I've developed friendships with. Um, it's, a really, it's a really thin line. What do you think? Mm. <laughs> yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you well, um, it's a pretty complicated question with deserves a pretty complicated answer but I'll try to keep it as simple as possible um, we need to educate the public inform the public about what's going on but on the other hand um, there is really no shortage of images of people suffering homeless other marginalized communities but we're talking about homelessness now uh, there's really no shortage of images so it's really how they're used how they're presented the context and as far as the moment that you're engaging with the person in the street or in a homeless shelter, uh, a lot of that depends also on the trust that you build with them and the, their particular circumstances at the moment, as Laura has said. If they're going through an extraordinarily difficult period, it could be dehumanizing to show somebody begging or you know, uh, out of control, having some sort of uh, crisis in their life at the moment. So uh, this is why we try to emphasize, I try to emphasize with my students and in my own work, uh, to try to humanize them by not just taking photographs of people in the dire circumstances of the day-to-day -day survival, although that's part of it, but also to do portraits of people and let and interview them and let them tell their own stories and sort of, you know, uh, put a human face to the to the crisis. Now, with your with your experience, professor, as a documentarian and photographer, why do you think it is important for the audience to be more aware about this issue of homelessness? Well, it's the same with any social issue in that, you know, people need to be informed in order to make decisions. They need to see the, the severity of the situation, the, the gravity of the situation, whatever the, whatever the crisis happens to be. In this case, you know, I think people are aware that there's a expanding homeless problem that's being fought on many fronts by people like Laura, uh, activists and, and city officials and different agencies and so on. But uh, they need to be, re I, I think, if anything, there's probably not enough 
news type coverage of the day-to-day -day progress of the battle against homelessness. So it's not just about photography, it's about multimedia, it's about writing, it's about all forms of uh, educating the public so that they can realize, oh, this is what's happening, this is how much money's being raised, this is how long it's taking to solve this aspect of the problem, and the media has a role to play in that, for sure. Thank you. Now, Laura, you've also worked with the homeless for years. What would you like others to understand about this issue? It's really hard to get people services and get them connected. Um, like to say like what David was saying, if the media wasn't there and people don't see this, if something's broken and you don't know about it and you don't see it, how do you try to fix it? A <clears> lot of things need to be fixed. Um, the way the system works, um, the f where the funding goes. I remember the first time I brought someone to a homeless help center and I was like, oh, okay, got them connected. They're gonna be off the streets and it wasn't as easy. I followed them for eight months until they got off the streets and I think people need to be aware that if you do call somebody to get someone connected, it's months if not years to get that person help. Now one of your big campaigns has to do with hygiene. Uh, can you explain why this is a big issue when it comes to the homeless? So uh, a lot of people don't realize that feminine hygiene is really hard to get when you're a woman on the streets. Um, sometimes you have to choose between a meal or feminine hygiene. Um, and it's, it's just not right. Um, I mean, homelessness has a stigma, menstruation has a stigma, and we're just trying to change that. So my sister and I started a hygiene campaign with Sisters on the Streets, and we've collected and distributed over 20,000 pads and tampons. It's just, it's just needed. I think that's, if I can just butt in here a little bit, that's one of the things that people just take for granted. They don't even think about that aspect of it. You know, that simple needs, like where, you, where do you go to the restroom? Where do you get a shower? How, how can somebody who's homeless uh, go to a job interview when they're dirty, when they're smelly, when they don't have clean clothes? So, uh, like a friend of ours likes to say, the homeless is, homelessness is kind of like an illness if you catch it. If you don't cure it quickly, it's harder to cure it because you get sort of sucked into it and you know it becomes more and more difficult to get out of it so what Laura and her sister are doing and what other people are doing and to fill these small needs uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that's uh, invaluable you know they're they're doing something that should be being done by government agencies by you know other other uh, larger corporate uh, people that have deeper pockets but uh, they're going out there and they're doing it almost on a volunteer basis, so it's extraordinary. So I've also seen your work and your newsletters, and I've noticed the photos you take of the homeless, uh, you cover their faces. So I'd like to know why you do that. When we help some of the people that we do, um, it's really tragic what they're going through. We're taking them to the hospital. Um, some of them we just, it doesn't matter what their faces look like. Um, it, it's we're trying to show communities what you can do mm -hmm. not not who the person is what but what you can do for somebody okay. Professor Blumenkrantz you have won multiple awards for your work with the homelessness in Los Angeles and received the research scholarship and creative accomplishment grant from CSUN to create the one of us project we would like to see some of your work so um. Well, would you like me to? Yes, I would like you to this elaborate a, and tell us what's going this on. This is from a group of people that I've been documenting down uh, along the uh, 405 freeway at Nordoff for the last few years, and it turned into a sort of a relationship. Uh, uh, we're, I'm actually sort of friends with, with these folks. That's Terry and Amy. And this was one of the several times that they were taken off the street, arrested for vagrancy, for violations of, uh, you know, things like having shopping carts, being on the sidewalk where they're not supposed to be. It's an endless sort of cat and mouse game that they play with law enforcement. Uh, you know, can you sleep on the sidewalk? Can you be on the on ramps, the off ramps? And I've just been sort of following them for long enough where they know me and trust me. So the morning when the police came, um, they one of them texted me, Gracie, and said, "You got to come down here. This is it. There, it's a big, it's a big sweep." But these things happen all the time. Um, being able to show people photographs like that. You know, it's in the exhibition that's going on right now, and it, I think it, you know, I think it does sort of like open some people's eyes because they don't realize that this is part of the the hardship. You know, so what we basically have is like a group of people that are sort of internally displaced within our own society. They they're part of our society, but yet they're totally marginalized. Where 
they don't have a decent place to sleep or, or take care of themselves, and they're also harassed by the legal system. You know, once, they're, once you pick up a ticket for vagrancy of any, of any sort, that sort of stays with you for a long time. And there are government agencies, there are city agencies, uh, city attorney's office, they have programs to help expunge people's records and things like that. So the more you explore the, the, the crisis and get involved with people and talking to them on the street level, you, f you find out these things and you realize, wow, this is really like a nightmare for them, like an endless nightmare. How do you think one should go about taking such photos as this appropriately? Well, uh, it's really just a matter of realizing which photographs are needed. You know, do people need to see this? You don't want to take a photograph to make somebody look bad just gratuitously, just for, the, for your own benefit. You're, you're telling a story, and so you pick the photographs that are part of the essential part of that story that you're trying to tell. And in the case like this, I have a lot of photographs of these folks just relaxing, even laughing, you know, chatting with each other. But, you know, but their life is hard. And those moments are rare. Maybe they're a little bit rare, but uh, traumatic, to be sure. And rare for them, maybe. Maybe it happens once a month. But as a phenomenon, as a social phenomenon, it's happening all across the city. There's a lot of uh, issues with uh, the way that the city and the law enforcement are trying to grapple with the problem, trying to uh, respect and, 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 and uh, support property owners' rights, but also protect and support their civil rights and their human rights. And from your experience, how do you think they feel being photographed? Well, you know, it's always different, you know. Sometimes if you, if you establish a relationship with people, there are, I can go there, I can, I'm actually going to go there after I finish here. I'm going to pop on my bicycle and do my, my once or twice a week, I ride down there and see how they're doing. There's not many of them there right now, but if they were there and I show up, they're not going to stop doing what they're doing. They know me now. They're, they'll just keep talking and, and they, their guard is down, so to speak, and they allow me, they trust me. That uh, I think that's the main thing. They trust that I'm go not going to misuse their images and that I'm trying to, I'm on their side, and I'm trying to educate the public about their dilemma. So they're pretty much allowing me to take photographs. But if you just show up, roll up on somebody and, you know, at an off-ramp and just roll your window down, surprise, and start photographing them, you shouldn't be surprised if they, they don't like that and they, you know, they turn away or they yell at you or something like that. So it has to be handled with some delicacy and, and sensitivity. And with my students, we spend a lot of time before I even, if we're doing a project like this, when we do, we'll spend the first three, four weeks just talking about, you know, uh, all kinds of issues of representation and social voyeurism and, and exploitation and, and, you know, the proper way to approach the subject so that you can make them feel, you know, try to get them to understand that we're here not to take advantage of you, not to parade your disadvantage just for the sake of entertainment but it's really for, you know, for their benefit, hopefully. Let's take a look at the next photo. So this photo is more of an intimate photo. Uh, why did I know what do you think is the best way? You were talking about building trust, but I want to know how you build trust with the homeless and um, how well, you forge these relationships. Yeah. Well, this is Linda, who we, we know Linda very well, in fact, She's getting an apartment supposedly this week, finally, after all this time. Um, she's been on the streets for quite a while. She's one of the first people I met in that area. And boy, I can't tell you the number. She's, a, she's an artist. She paints with nail polish. You can probably see some of her paintings, some of her artwork somewhere. And there's other photographs that show them up more up close. And how many times the police have uh, raided her encampment and confiscated all of her artworks and her art supplies. I can't tell you the number of times that my students, uh, the fellow faculty members, other friends in the community have responded to my post on social media. Linda needs more nail polish. I've, how many bags of nail polish I've brought to her. So, you know, that's, these are the things that friends do for each other. There was a time when she was raided and she said, look, there's a ice chest in my camp with some bottles of wine go get them or else, or else they're going to disappear. So I'd drive down there and I'd get the box, the ice chest and walk off with it right in front of the police. 
And you know, these are things that you do with friends, whether they're homeless or not. You just sort of know each other and you sort of know what the other person's hobbies are and, and what, their, what their interests are. And um, yeah, it's difficult sometimes because there's unpredictability and a little bit of mental illness may be involved with someone like Linda, perhaps. But um, once you get involved with someone like that, you feel a certain obligation to be there for them when they need you, and, and it's hard to, you know, just to cut, cut those ties. Let's take a look at the next photo. So this photo doesn't follow the typical stereotype of homelessness because we see a friendship that's developed between both these ladies. Mm -hmm. What have you been, what have you seen working hand in hand with these communities? Well, I've seen this. I've seen love, I've seen friendships. I've, I've, I've seen a pack mentality at times in this particular group which again, Laura knows very well, that's Gracie. Gracie, I, I've actually taken her to neighborhood council meetings to get her to speak. Uh, she's a very articulate woman, she's elderly. She's off the street at the moment, temporarily, but actually somebody that I, my wife saw her a couple days ago on Plummer when they drove by, she was out there under the, uh, under the overpass. So she's still around. And so what you see though is like people creating a sense of family <coughs> wherever they can. So there's this group of people that, the ones that you've seen, Linda, Terry, Amy, Gracie, and Craig, and some other people that are sort of like the regular cast of characters in this sort of ongoing drama that I've been documenting for the last couple of years. And you see them at their best. You see them when they're crying. You see them when they're, when they're happy. Uh, Gracie is very sweet. And uh, another young girl had twins, and one of them died on the street so about a year ago. And the other one was taken into somebody's relative's home and they, they anointed Gracie as the honorary, like, godmother. And Gracie was so happy the day I, one day I rolled up to her little, on my bicycle to her little encampment, it was up when I was on the cul-de-sac over there. And uh, she had this, just clinging to this photograph of her, of this little baby. She's going, oh, I'm a grandmother. And she was so happy that she had that, that sense of still being loved and wanted and being part of some sort of family structure. So you see that, you also see a lot of Honor among thieves. You see, you know, you see a lot of problems and a lot of. Uh, you see drugs and you see a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, what you see are human beings trying to survive in a very difficult situation. Laura, but what about you? What have you seen in these communities? They're just like neighbors without houses. Mm. <laughs> mm. They, they they dog sit for each other yep. um, when someone. <clears throat> dies, they hold memorial services, they celebrate birthdays, they share food. Um, yeah. they, they do watch out for each other. Yeah, and, and many of them that we, that, we, that we see all the time, they, they had rich in, imaginative lives, and they still do, but their resources are cut down to the bare bone, and their finances are cut down to the bare bone, and so their opportunities to pursue their interests are eliminated because their main concern is where am I going to, what am I going to eat tonight? Where am I going to sleep tonight? And so they're preoccupied with those survival uh, concerns, and it it makes it really difficult for them. But we we know them as as people, you know, not as some other species. You know, they're they're human. They're very human. Yeah. Let's take a look at the last photo. So here's uh, one of the photos from the One of Us series. Can mm. you tell us about it? Well, this guy's name is PJ. I didn't. He's one of the one of many people that I uh, for this project. I I was able to visit four locations around the San Fernando Valley where uh, a, a mobile shower unit goes in the morning. It was a mobile shower unit that's that's run by the San Fernando Valley Rescue Mission. <clears throat> so I, I made arrangements with the management of these four different facilities to show up with a with a backdrop and a, and a studio lights and a, a student assistant and an iPad to re, to find out who would like to tell their story. To share their personal experience and be photographed in a way that I don't want to say humanize them, re rehumanize them, to make them so that when you look at the photograph, the first thing you you think about is their you know is their face, not their condition. You can look at this photograph and you don't. This guy could be a former baseball player. He could be a doctor. He could be anybody. And that's what that was the objective: is to just remove them out of that stigma and allow people to, as I said at the beginning of the show, we have enough photographs of people in dire circumstances begging and, and looking pathetic and, and whatnot. And so the idea here 
was to take a different sort of photograph that was just to show people as, as being human beings. And there's other photographers who are doing this kind of work too. And I think that is very effective. I know when people go into the exhibit, I had all my students go in for an, ex for an assignment this semester to go into the gallery and I asked them to write about the, which part of the exhibit they found the most effective. And many of them said they found this part of it the most effective because it did have their words with their own quotes with their portrait and it does seem to be an effective way of humanizing them and, and elevating them above that sort of like feel sorry for me you know because the people that uh, participated in the project like like PJ and, and the other 40 or so people uh, the people that agreed to participate were the kind of people that said this isn't me I'm not supposed to be homeless most of them with a few exceptions I'm not supposed to be homeless um, I'm and they had a chance to sort of vent about the way they feel society uh, looks at them and sort of looks down at them. So it was a good opportunity for that. Thank you, Professor. Laura, what are some stereotypes of homeless people that you see on TV or local news that are frustrating? That they're all addicts. Um, that's the biggest one. Um, and even if they are having um, sobriety issues, um, I don't think people realize what is causing them to try to numb something what kind of trauma has happened to them in the past, sometimes from early, early childhood is what someone is um, trying to numb themselves with. And sometimes, sometimes it's really sad. Sometimes drugs and alcohol is a lot easier to find than to get the help that you need to uh, erase everything that happened in your past. So I, I want, I really wish people would um, learn more about um, why people use just the trauma. Yeah, we we always share this sentiment that you know we know we all know a lot of people who have drug problems and alcohol problems and mental illness problems who are not homeless. So to automatically enmesh them together as a as a sort of this sort of natural pairing is is a false equivalency, really. You know, it, it, it's if you had to go through what some of these people have to go through, you'd probably want to escape reality from time to time yourself and you know some of the it's it's uh, unfortunate but it's the reality and that they're all criminals and they're not yeah. I'm a bleeding heart for the disabled senior citizens I meet on the streets and that's a majority of them is that and that the aged out foster care youth um, kids it's just so many of those and, and plus like the LGBTQ that's out there from um, their parents or their family disowning them because uh, what they choose to be that that's out there too um, and they're not all panhandling on the 405 freeway or, or living on the train track some are like sleeping in their cars and going to CSUN <laughs> or sleeping in their cars I had one kid that I interviewed for this project who was sleeping in his car in the parking lot of Walmart where he worked they were kind enough to allow him to sleep in his car in the parking lot, but not kind enough to give him enough of a salary so that he didn't have to do that. So, right. you know, rents are high. Rent is something we haven't really talked about, but the real estate, uh, gentrification, there's so many factors that contribute into why people become homeless, you know. And we haven't even talked about veterans, and, and there's, there's just a lot of different factors. It's a, it's a pretty complicated situation. Um, while doing your photography, uh, Professor, have you ever felt in danger while taking a photograph? In the homeless mm -hmm. situation, not, not so much. One time I was on, on the on-ramp at the 405 there and I, we went back behind the fence and some, some Good Samaritans showed up with some meals for the, for the, and it was a pretty hardcore bunch of guys who were staying back there. And one of the guys was uh, not happy at all that I was there with a the camera, and he was pretty menacing. But I don't really, you know, I felt like everybody's got my back, the other people know me. So I, no, I never felt, you know, in imminent danger, no. My last question is, what advice would you give our viewers who are not activists or journalists, but still want to participate in making homeless issue better? Laura, what would your advice be? You can vote. Okay. There's a lot of things on the ballot. Um, Prop one, two, and ten. Yes, on all of them. Professor. Yeah, and you can volunteer at 
you know, with some of these organizations like the North Valley Caring Services or the San Fernando Rescue Mission. There's so many of them. And one thing that everybody can do is when you walk past a homeless person, you can talk to them and smile and just don't look past them. Don't, don't treat them like they don't exist because I think that's the hardest thing for those people and to be, to be uh, ostracized and be treated as untouchables. That's a very dehumanizing uh, experience for anybody. And if you see a woman on the streets, give that girl a tampon. I want to thank my guests for being here today. <laughs> I'm Londi Sagastume. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. You wouldn't give yourself or your loved one poison, would you? Then why would you take or give counterfeit medications that may contain the wrong or no active ingredient? Counterfeit medications are out there. They can be ineffective and harmful to your health. Be a smart consumer and know your pharmacy, especially if you're purchasing medication online. of businesses never recover after experiencing a major disaster. Make a plan at ready.gov slash business. Thank you for watching On Point. David Blumenkrantz's photographs are on exhibit at the Los Angeles Museum of Social Justice until the end of this month. You can see the photos online at the museum's website. If you are interested in learning more about Laura Rothbone's organization, visit hygienecampaign.wordpress.com. If you would like to volunteer to help the homeless, go to epath.org. You can follow us on social media at CSUN on Point. You can hear us on KCSN 88.5 FM on Sunday mornings at 5.30. You can watch us on Santa Clarita Valley Television on Sundays at 5 on LA 36 at 8.30 Thursday nights. For all of us here at On Point, I'm Imai Milan Wright.